Okay, welcome to CM4650 Polymer Rheology. Um, this is being taught for the first time in an online section and in an in-class section. So I want to welcome to this experiment. Um, I want to give you some introductory information and then actually I'm going to start by finding out who everybody is because I'm terrible at names. So even with a class of 40, I do badly. But with a class of 10, I do pretty well. So I'm going to have to start to learn who everybody is. So let's see if everybody's on my list. Warren Ball, you're Warren, OK. I know I had you last semester, but you know, that's how it is with a bigger class. Uh, Benjamin Conard, OK. Brian Edwards, uh, Andy Wong, Jason Jacobs, Chi Ming Lei, David Markipka, okay. Eric Minner, Juan Marin Lee, Carl Palm, and Andy Cole is thinking about adding the class. Okay, so that's 11. That's a typical size for this class, so uh, we'll be running it just the same. Um, I've given four handouts. I hope you've picked up the syllabus and course information. On, this is all on the web, both in WebCT and open to the public. So if you look on the course information sheet, there's a, a link for the web page. You can also Google me and the name of this class, and it comes up pretty fast. And also um, in WebCT, the WebCT inside WebCT, it just links to the outside pages. The only additional reason you would need to go into WebCT is to get a look at these lectures. So those will only be available behind WebCT. Um, as stated in the syllabus, this uh, purpose of this class is to learn about rheology, which is non-Newtonian fluid mechanics. The text for the course is my book, Understanding Rheology, from 2001. So you're getting it right from the source. Um, it's, we cover almost the entire textbook. We don't get through the advanced chapter, which is chapter 10, uh, chapter 9. Other than advanced constitutive modeling, we do everything else in the textbook. On this course information sheet, I've also listed some supplementary texts. Uh, the book I used to teach this before I wrote my own was Dynamics of Polymeric Liquids, which everybody in the field of rheology knows. It has two editions, second edition in 1986. But it's a much harder book than our book. So I highly recommend that to you for additional information. Um, transport phenomena, which perhaps you've looked at in uh, fluid mechanics class, Bird, Stewart, and Lightfoot, written by the same author as Dynamics of Polymeric Liquids. That's a good reference for the Newtonian topics we'll cover. And then Viscoelastic Properties of Polymers by John Ferry is a book on the behavior of different materials in the linear viscoelastic zone. Um, also, second or third edition of a book, uh, very classic. And Rheometry is a book about rheological measurements that's out of print, but we have it in the library. Uh, that will relate to the last week of the course on rheometry. Uh, grades are homeworks are graded. The exams are closed book in this class. And there's two exams and a final. And all of that is on the syllabus as well. So you'll see that we have seven homeworks, two exams, and a final exam. I've given some days off because we're going to have evening exams. So for instance, the day before Carnival, the Friday before Easter, and the last day of class I'm, I have scheduled as off days. Now looking at the syllabus, you'll see a couple of things. If you look at uh, the first three weeks of the class, the topics are vectors and tensors and Newtonian fluid mechanics. And that's because I've learned, I've been teaching this class since 1990 in approximately this form. And what I find and what I found as a student of rheology myself is that uh, undergraduate fluid mechanics is not a, not a good enough preparation for the study of rheology. And so we need to look at that material again in a way that uses the more advanced mathematical techniques that we're going to use in this class, vectors and tensors. So we've all had vectors since maybe high school, uh, probably have not had tensors, but you've seen them in fluid mechanics class because you've seen the stress tau 2, 1. So the stress component tau 2, 1 is the 2, 1 component of a tensor, 
and you've had that the Newtonian relationship, uh, dv1, dx2, uh, for Newtonian fluids. But for us, we need more than that stress tensor, than, than one stress component. We need all nine of the stress components in order to handle non-Newtonian fluids. So that's why we're going to spend some time getting up to speed on that and learning how to do the calculations. So just like in calculus, there's the theory of why things work, and then there's just learning how to make it happen, the integral of u to the n, u to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. You have to learn how those mechanisms work. And that's what we're going to be doing at the start of class. The good news is that you already know Newtonian fluid mechanics. Uh, not to say that I'm quizzing you on it. I'm, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know. But you've seen it before. So we're going to learn this new way of looking at it, this new vocabulary, with a subject that you've already, that you've already um, studied. Then um, the middle portion of the course, we introduce uh, all the various non-Newtonian phenomena that we're trying to model, the reason why we're going to all these uh, lengths to learn a new technique. And then in the last third of the course, which goes from about week nine to the end, we actually do non-Newtonian modeling. Uh, at the end of this course, you'll be ahead of uh, just about anybody in the field because this is one of the few universities that offers an undergraduate course in uh, polymer rheology. I took the class as a graduate student. Uh, but it is, uh, we have years and years, as I said, since 1990, we have uh, 16 years of experience teaching this to undergrads, including juniors. There's a couple of juniors in the class here. And it works just fine because we do that introductory material and get you up to speed and uh, uh, help you to assimilate the information. OK, the other two handouts, one is the homework. Uh, the homework is due in the middle of next week. It's not that bad, uh, but it is to something to get started on. And then the homework rules. Because homework is graded, you can talk to each other about it, but please don't do each other's homework. Now, let me say a word about closed book exams. One of the reasons the exams are closed book is because there are only so many problems uh, that are doable in an exam period. That's a practical reason. But another reason, more philosophical reason, is that uh, it's a little bit more important in rheology to really know how to do it, how to get the calculation, because it's a very complex subject. And as a complex subject, if you rely on uh, looking through your notes and trying to find things in your book during the exam, uh, it's not going to work. So we have to, you, you'll see the, there are already scoop exams on the, on the web, so you can see what kind of things we ask um, in the past. Uh, it's all, as I said, quite doable, but because it's closed book, you're going to need to know how to do these problems without the safety net of the book and your homework and lots of handouts um, on the table with you. OK, so as I said uh, before the taping started, I know it's a little awkward to be on tape uh, asking a question uh, on a tape. It is recorded. But I think it's only for us this year. So let's try to forget that we're on tape and just ask the questions that you need to ask. Um, if, if for, whatever, for whatever reason some lecture this year uh, turns out to be a complete digression or something, then I'll tape it again in the future. So it's not something that we have to worry about. Just treat this class. Let's see if we can treat this class like a regular class. And I'm going to then look at the tapes myself and see if this is a good idea or not. So it's a bit of an experiment. I can already tell that there's a much more distance in this kind of a format than there would be in class because Sometimes I'm going to be hidden behind this console. But we'll see. There are great advantages. For instance, if you're traveling, if you get an interview or something like that, you're not going to have to miss the lecture. So any questions right now? OK, so I'm going to start then uh, with my material on the slides. Um, this cl uh, class, as I said, is polymer rheology. And let me explain a little bit what rheology is. So the word rheology is a made-up word. Uh, it comes from the word in Greek for flow, uh, rheo. Ology, as you're familiar with, with biology, biology is the study of life. 
Um, ology means study of. Rheology means the study of flow. It was invented only in the 19, late 1920s because scientists who were working in the field of polymers or what was called colloid science at the time were from a variety of fields. They were chemists, they were civil engineers, they were uh, mathematicians, they were mechanical engineers, they were chemical engineers. And they had this thing in common and they needed a name for it. And so actually in Easton, Pennsylvania, Lafayette College, a professor coined the term rheology. I wrote an article uh, a couple of years ago called What is Rheology Anyway? And actually if you Google that phrase, what is rheology anyway, that article comes right up. Uh, because it is a word that rheology that confuses some people. It sounds like theology, especially with my name, Faith Morris, and people think I'm teaching a theological course of some sort and I just have a typo. But no, it's rheology. Um, what is it? It's the study of deformation and flow. But we can think of it in a variety of ways. In that article, I give examples for the lay person of what rheology is. So what rheology is is eas most easily defined in the kitchen. So quantities like um, mayonnaise or flour, this is a picture I took in Korea of a guy making noodles. And those noodles, when he m works that dough, he's constantly stretching and folding the noodle dough to make uh, very tasty noodles. Um, the fact that flour dough even produces that kind of deformation is unique to its material structure. It has these very long chain molecules that have to be oriented and worked and subjected to a certain deformation in order to produce the texture that we like in our noodles or in our bread or in our cakes or things like that. So food and the uh, handling of food is a very intensely rheological process. But even something as simple as making yourself a sandwich with mayonnaise can teach you something about rheology. And mayonnaise is a nice example that I use because everybody's uh, in America anyway, has had the experience, you open up a mayonnaise jar and you look inside and it looks just like it did when you closed the jar the last time. Every, every indentation that you ever made is still there. It doesn't appear to flow as opposed to say honey the honey jar, I've timed it, you know, within a minute after trying to serve yourself some honey, it levels out and becomes an absolutely level plane. And that's because honey is a Newtonian fluid. Honey only, if there's any stress on honey, meaning the stress due to gravity in this case, it flows. If there's stress, it flows, end of discussion. Mayonnaise is non-Newtonian. Even though it's sitting there in a gravity field and stress is pulling down on the walls of the mayonnaise, it doesn't move because it has a yield stress. So mayonnaise is an example of a, of a material that has a complex rheological property and we can move on from there. There are dozens and hundreds of materials, plastics, asphalt, um, most foods, chocolate, ice cream, paint, applying paint on the wall, coatings, Almost everything really is non-Newtonian. In fact, when I give you the list of things that are non-Newtonian, and maybe it makes you wonder, well, why did we spend any time on Newtonian fluids if everything's non-Newtonian? Well, there are some very important Newtonian fluids too. Water, oil. Okay, so water and oil and things, aqueous solutions and oil solutions are all Newtonian. So there are important fluids also that are Newtonian, but really there's a very large number of fluids that are non-Newtonian. One of the interesting ones listed on this slide that's non-Newtonian is uh, cornstarch and water. Perhaps you have attended a demonstration, maybe a science demonstration in high school or even given one yourself where you take cornstarch and water and at certain concentrations when you stir cornstarch and water it feels like you're just stirring water. But if you stir it faster, if you try to whip it like whipping eggs, it feels like it's getting thicker. But then when you stop turning it, it's back to feeling like water. And you can also punch that solution and it'll, your hand will just bounce off it. And that's an example of a shear thickening fluid. The faster you deform it, the thicker it becomes. When you're not deforming it, or when you deform it slowly, like putting your hand in or slowly stirring it, uh, its viscosity is very low. So that's actually a, a fun example you can do uh, yourself and it only costs you about 39 cents because cornstarch is cheap. Now, 
that's a layman's look at what rheology is. There's also the scientific look. And I've already used some of these phrases in describing because I am a scientist, so I think of it this way. Uh, to, a, to a scientist, there are things like yield stresses, which is what I describe mayonnaise having. There's some stress below which, if the stress applied is below that yield stress, it won't flow. Gravity is below the yield stress of mayonnaise. But as soon as you take your, pen, uh, your knife out and try to make a sandwich, it flows very easily. It's not like peanut butter thick. It's very thin. It's very easy to make a sandwich with mayonnaise. That's in a yield stress effect. Viscoelastic effects uh, include what we see with silly putties. So here's the uh, most common example of a viscoelastic fluid, which has already uh, flattened out on the table as I've been waiting. But this silly putty is very elastic. It bounces, but it's actually a liquid. This fluid, and this is actually in the movie that we'll see, this will sit there, and if we leave it for long enough, which in the case of this fluid is an hour or so, it will puddle out as if it's water. Memory effects also showed by silly putty, shear thickening and shear thinning, which I already described. Why would we want to study rheology? We'd like to study it because we're engineers and we want to make things out of all of these fluids that I've been talking about. Chocolate is a very interesting material for its rheological effects. It actually has some flow instabilities during processing. I've seen some very interesting talks out of Switzerland where they're experts on chocolate. But plastics, coatings, uh, anything uh, using a polymer is likely to uh, have a rheological effect in its manufacturing or its application. So the stresses that are generated, the forces that it takes to do an operation, and even the shapes that the device is going to take can be affected by its rheological properties. So our goal is to understand the kinds of flow that take place. Um, oh, by the way, all of these slides are available on the website now in PDF form. So you can print them out ahead of time if you like. Please don't print out the whole semester because if I decide to improve it, uh, I'll post it you know, the day before or something or the week before and you will have already printed it. But they are all, the entire semester's worth is already on the web. Okay, so we want to understand rheology qualitatively but also quantitatively and that's why we're going to spend so much time on vectors and tensors. And we want to be quantitative because we need to be able to predict. We need to be able to design extruders, uh, design molds, um, design coding flows and coding devices, um, design materials to do a certain kind of an application. And all of that requires modeling that you would use uh, some sort of a computer model or a fluid mechanic model that will require um, rheological models. So this next slide, in, which explains how we're going to uh, look at the quantitative part of rheology, also parallels the structure of the course. We're going to try to understand the kinds of flow and deformation effects. That's the middle of the course when I said we're going to talk about material functions and uh, fluid behavior. We're going to then go on to non-Newtonian modeling, which is quantitative rheological modeling, including two principal types, uh, inelastic modeling, which is power law and other generalized Newtonian fluids, and linear viscoelastic modeling, which is uh, the, linear, the Maxwell model, the generalized linear viscoelastic model. And then finally, we're going to also talk about flow measurement, which is the last week of the course. When we've fully develop these non-Newtonian models, we will be in a position to do this last step, which is to do design or optimization using those models. So this slide has a list, which is a, probably a little bit hard to read here today, but a list of uh, some references that are, in addition to the ones on the introductory sheet, uh, this book by Barnes, on which I call Descriptive Rheology, is not mathematical. And a lot of people like it very much. It's called An Introduction to Rheology. The problem is that uh, once you understand Barnes, you can't move forward to understanding more complicated books, whereas, whereas our goal here is to make you able to read really the cutting edge of rheological um, literature. And that's what I call quantitative rheology. 
Uh, this book by Dealey and Whisperin is um, a nice companion to ours because it mentions quite a lot of plastics processing. You see it's called Melt Rheology and its role in plastics processing. Uh, Ron Larson wrote an excellent book on the structure and rheology of complex fluids. So that's a nice additional listing and discussion of the various types of properties that are seen. And then uh, suspension behavior, which is another category, very, very strongly important in industry. A lot of paints are suspensions, a lot of foods are suspensions. And so there's an additional uh, book by Larson. Ron Larson is the chair of ChemEng at University of Michigan. And he's written two books on rheology, former um, president of the Society of Rheology. All right, so the big picture for the modeling we do is that uh, just as in regular Newtonian fluid mechanics, mass, momentum, and energy are conserved. Uh, in order to solve the momentum balance in particular, we need to uh, understand vectors and tensors. And the momentum balance itself, uh, the Cauchy momentum equation, is a differential equation. So we'll need to use some differential equation solving techniques, but really not too much. In fact, uh, what we did in CM3110, our undergrad fluid mechanics course, is almost enough. The additional math we do in this class is mostly the vectors and tensors. We're not going to need to solve really complex um, differential equations. The, you'll see them, and we could, uh, we could talk about doing full three-dimensional models of that sort, but that's really quite an expert uh, to be able to do that. Kathy Feigl, a professor in the math department here, she does constitutive modeling, um, full 2 and 3D uh, models of various flows, and uh, that requires that kind of expertise that she has. Now, the link between uh, the conservation laws and what we're looking to calculate, which is stresses, and deformation is called the constitutive equation. And that's what we're looking for here. The constitutive equation, we'll discuss this in detail in the class, but for Newtonian fluids, it's the Newtonian constitutive equation, and for non-Newtonian fluids, it's one of hundreds of choices of constitutive equation that we're going to show you. The basic momentum equation is this one, written in Gibbs notation with tensors. It has the stress tensor in it, and that's where we'll be concentrating. So here is what I uh, wrote earlier, uh, the Newtonian, Newton's law of viscosity that we learn as undergrads is a very simple uh, one-dimensional rule. The problem is it doesn't work for paints, plastics, and um, high-tech coatings. So instead of, of this one-dimensional rule, we need a function. We need a stress tensor, all nine components, a function of the deformation of the material, which is given by the function gamma dot. Now, I want to sh end the class by showing you a 22-minute video, which is an example of lots of crazy things, including um, a demonstration of the flowing of silly, silly putty. But I have a few slides here to give you an introduction to what you're going to see on the film. The film was made in the late 50s, I think. So it's in black and white, and it's a little dated in terms of style. But fl fluids don't flow any differently now than they did 50 years ago. So all of that is still good. You're going to see, in fact, in the video, um, a chart just like the one on the slide here. And I want to give you a second to look at it so that when he talks about it, you'll, you'll get it a little bit better. The nomenclature that they used in the 50s, uh, remember, or maybe not remember, but imagine that uh, 40 or 50 years ago, the people who were doing this kind of work were coming out of engineering mechanics disciplines. Uh, they were experts in continuum mechanics, and the pitch was to people at the graduate or advanced graduate level. So the way that he's describing things in, he's uh, inferring that his audience has quite a bit of flu mechanics knowledge. So to him, it's clear that when you're talking about um, regimes of flow, there are three regimes he wants to show. The inviscid type of fluid, the Newtonian fluid, and now here's the only new thing he's introducing, the non-Newtonian fluid. And he wants to compare them to 
the forms of the momentum balance, which are the Euler equation, which maybe you've never heard of, but it's very simple. The Euler equation is the Navier-Stokes equation, which you have heard of, but with the viscosity set to zero. So the inviscid fluid has zero viscosity, and so it's the momentum balance with zero viscosity. This middle line should be the one you've heard about before. For Newtonian fluids, the momentum balance is the Navier-Stokes. And then for non-Newtonian fluids, that's what's new in our problem. Now, the inviscid fluid with the Euler equation, you get isotropic stress, which is to say that only pressure is important. And that's why in civil engineering and mechanical engineering, their emphasis in fluid mechanics is on very often on inviscid flow where only pressure is important. In chemical engineering, we're more concerned with viscosity. So we have uh, been talking more about Newtonian fluids. And in, for Newtonian fluids, as I showed on a previous slide, the stress is a function of the instantaneous velocity gradient, Newton's law of viscosity. And so what he's going to show you is that stress is a function of a history of the velocity gradient. It's not an instantaneous function anymore. And that's how we're going to get the memory effects that we're going to see in the video. So he's going to show a couple, a bunch of experiments that contrast Newtonian and non-Newtonian behavior. In Newtonian behavior, when you put a fluid between two plates and move the top plate, the classic Newton experiment, if you then plot the strain, gamma is strain, versus time, so this is like the displacement of this upper plate this displacement with time of this upper plate, you get a linear function, okay, just a straight line function. Um, that is in contrast to the non-Newtonian case, where instead of this straight line function, we get a non-straight line, a non-linear function. Going back one slide again, he's also going to show flow in a tube. Again, the hagen poiseuille equation, the result of flow in a tube, pressure-driven flow of a Newtonian fluid, uh, flow rate versus pressure drop, or pressure drop versus flow rate, whichever way you like to plot it, it's a straight line. This is the hagen poiseuille equation, straight line. For non-Newtonian fluids, it's not a straight line. There's shear thinning. The higher the pressure, in this case, the pressure gives this pressure gives this flow rate. If you double the pressure, doubling the flow rate would be right there, but it, the flow rate is more than double. So doubling the flow rate would be there. It's more than double the flow rate. That's shear thinning. Going back again to the previous slide, uh, for Newtonian fluids, when you stir them, and you've done this before, when you stir your sugar into your coffee, there's a depression in the center of the coffee. That's due to fluid inertia. In the case of non-Newtonian fluids, you get a, quite a different effect. It climbs up the rod. So if you've ever done any cooking with flour, if you make a thick batter on a mix master, it sometimes crawls right up into the motor of the mix master, making an enormous mess. That's rod climbing. That's a non-Newtonian effect. So we're going to see in the video examples that are due to history, so memory, and examples that are due to non-linearity. So you can have two kinds of non-Newtonian effects. One is that the material can remember past configurations, like this, this ball of silly, silly putty can remember it used to be a ball, but by now it's been flowing and it's got a flat bottom. So now it's flat on the bottom and it's rounded on the top because it's been flowing for these 30 minutes that we've been talking. So uh, for later, I don't need to go through all of these, but these are examples from the film that I've categorized into two categories, the history of the deformation and nonlinear effects. And you'll see lots of, of these examples. So this film uh, is a NCFM film. That's the National Committee on Fluid Mechanics Films. It was funded by NSF. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, they made a variety of, um, of these films. And we actually have 26 of these films in the department. So if at any time you're interested in learning more about pressure or surface tension or any of these kind of fluid mechanics effects, we have all these videotapes. And 
they're all really quite nice, actually. All right, so this is how we'll finish out the classes by watching the video, and then uh, starting on Friday, we'll uh, continue starting in on vectors and tensors. So if we could start the video. Rheology, in its broadest sense, is a study of the relationship between force and deformation in continuous media. In this film, we shall focus our attention on fluids. We have marked a portion of a flow field outside the viscous boundary layer. Here, water behaves almost like an inviscid fluid. In the model of the inviscid fluid, the basic assumption behind the stress deformation relation, whether the fluid is at equilibrium or in motion, is that there are no shear stresses, or equivalently, that the pressure is isotropic. This statement, when combined with the balance of momentum equation, leads to Euler's equation of motion. In this flow, glycerin shows evidence of shear stresses. Water and glycerin are two of many fluids that behave in a manner called Newtonian. With no relative motion, the Newtonian fluid has no shear stresses. The pressure is isotropic. In relative motion, however, the stresses are linear functions of the instantaneous velocity gradients. If we formulate this stress deformation relation for the Newtonian fluid so that it is independent of the observer and coupled with momentum equations, we obtain the Navier-Stokes equation. There are many situations, however, for which these models are quite inadequate. This is especially the case when you are dealing with materials containing large molecules. This ball, for example, bounces quite vigorously like an elastic solid. Yet, it really is a fluid. We'll come back to it later. Here's the viscous material, which I can pour into this beaker. No, I think I'll use this beaker instead. I can even cut it to length. This material is a solution of a high polymer. Some other materials that do not follow the simple Newtonian model are molten plastics, egg white, paint, and mayonnaise. Mayonnaise holds its shape if you let it alone, yet it spreads with ease. Here is a more controllable experiment illustrating the same phenomenon. There is no stopcock at the bottom, and this vessel is open to the atmosphere on top, and yet this clay suspension does not flow. I can put this simple piston here, place this small weight on it, Still no flow. Now a larger weight. It flows, but very slowly. A much larger weight. The flow is fairly rapid. I take the weight off. The flow stops. In a state of equilibrium, this material can support a shearing stress up to a critical value called a yield value. Even with materials not having yield values, the Newtonian fluid cannot explain many flow phenomena. For many of these, a more general model, 
that of the memory fluid, does provide an explanation. For the memory fluid, the pressure is isotropic in the equilibrium state where no changes of either the stress or the deformation are taking place. In relative motion, however, in contrast to the Newtonian fluid, the history of the deformation is significant. Instead of a linear function, the memory fluid reveals nonlinearities. In fact, nonlinearity affects both the shear stresses and the normal stresses. So, for the memory fluid, the stress is a nonlinear function of the history of the deformation gradient. For this model too, flow problems are solved by expressing this assumption mathematically and using the momentum equations. First, we will look at experiments demonstrating that stress does depend on the history of the deformation. This material exhibits both viscous and elastic characteristics. Honey has a high viscosity, but no elasticity. Remember the fluid ball? It was like an elastic solid during the short impact of bouncing. An elastic solid has a preferred configuration to which it will return when stresses are removed. A viscoelastic fluid behaves similarly if the stress has been applied only for a short time. But in contrast to the elastic solid, the fluid's memory is not perfect. This time-lapse sequence shows that if the stress acts for a time long compared with the relaxation times of the fluid, the fluid forgets its previous state. In reality, it took 45 minutes for the force of gravity to change the ball into a puddle. This is a container of high polymer solution. I'll drop in a steel ball. Again, once more in slow motion. This liquid too is viscoelastic. Here's some more polymer solution. I can put this cylinder into it. And turn it a full 360 degrees. When I let go quickly, it returns almost half the distance. This time, I'll hold it for a few seconds. Since the fluid has a fading memory, when I do let go, the recovery is a much smaller fraction of the original deformation. We can make quantitative measurements of viscoelastic behavior in this type of apparatus. The test liquid is confined in this annulus. The outer cylinder is held stationary, and we can apply a torque to the inner one with this weight, which we can hang there. A trigger here releases the mechanism. To remove the torque, there is a slip toggle there. We can record the response of the inner cylinder that is, its angular rotation as a function of time, with a pen on a chart moving at constant speed. The weight of the recording pen is counterbalanced by this small weight. We have, of course, designed this experiment to minimize extraneous effects arising from the inertia of the fluid, the inertia of the moving parts, and from friction. The first experiment is with a Newtonian fluid designated by the letter N. A constant velocity is attained almost at once since inertial effects are small. Now the applied torque is zero again and the cylinder stops immediately.
This time, the fluid in the annulus is viscoelastic. A constant velocity is not immediately obtained. Even though the stress is constant, the deformation and the rate of deformation are changing with time. Now the weight is disengaged. Let's watch that again. It takes a while for the viscoelastic fluid to acquire the steady state motion appropriate to the constant torque. When we remove the torque, we see the cylinder actually reverse its direction. Although no torque is being applied, the material is deforming because of the elastic character of the fluid. Not all the energy used to produce the flow was dissipated. Some was stored and then recovered. We have looked at some experiments showing that the stress depends on the history of the deformation. To illustrate nonlinear behavior, we shall do experiments in which the time-dependent characteristics of the fluids are negligible. Here we have two identical reservoirs with two identical outlet tubes. One contains a Newtonian fluid, the other a non-Newtonian. The levels are the same. At first, the non-Newtonian fluid flows faster. However, after a while, it is overtaken by the Newtonian fluid. The basic phenomenon occurring here is more easily seen if the pressure head remains practically constant. These are two identical burettes containing the same Newtonian fluid. The pressure head in one is twice that in the other. The ratio of rates of flow is also two to one, as we expect from Poisson's law. But if we charge both burettes with the fluid exhibiting nonlinear behavior and apply the same ratio of pressure heads, the result is quite different. With this polymer solution, when the head is doubled, the rate of flow is more than doubled. It appears that the viscosity is less at the higher velocity gradient. This type of steady flow behavior is called pseudoplastic or shear thinning. There are some fluids that create a contrary situation. For this suspension, the viscosity is higher at the higher rates of flow. This is called dilatant or shear thickening behavior. In the steady laminar flow of incompressible Newtonian fluids through tubes, a single material constant the coefficient of viscosity governs the volume rate of flow and the velocity field. Here we get the familiar parabolic velocity profile. However, for more general fluids, the flow rate and the velocity field are governed by a viscosity function. For such a fluid, the velocity profile can be very different from parabolic. We have seen how nonlinearity affects shear stresses. It also has an unusual effect on the normal stresses. Here is some glycerin, and here is one of my wife's favorite recipes.
Why does the cake batter climb the mixing shaft in contrast to the behavior of the Newtonian fluid? We can get a better idea of what happened there if we look at a simpler experimental configuration. This shaft is mounted to rotate inside the larger glass tube in a coaxial geometry. The shaft is a hollow tube with a hole through the wall. The force per unit area exerted by the fluid in the direction normal to this cylindrical surface will be indicated by the level of the fluid inside this manometer tube. The stress normal to the outer cylinder will be shown by the level of the fluid in this sidearm manometer tube attached over a hole in the outer cylinder. When the central shaft is rotated, a shear flow is established in the annulus. The polymer solution climbs up around the rotating center tube as the cake batter did. Because the fluid is so viscous, it took about an hour for the level of the fluid inside the tubes to indicate the steady state stress difference. Note that the stress exerted by the fluid normal to the cylinder walls is greater on the inner cylinder than on the outer. This is in contrast to the behavior of a Newtonian fluid, where the centrifugal field alone governs the pressure distribution. Here is another apparatus where we can observe a related phenomenon. This time, the material is sheared between two parallel disks, one of which can rotate, while the other is stationary. The distribution of stress normal to the stationary disk will be shown by the level of the fluid in these glass tubes. Of course, this level will be uniform in the tubes if there is no rotation. Remember, this time we are not concerned with the flow in the annulus between the vertical walls, but with the shear flow in the narrow space between the flat plates. If the fluid is Newtonian, the height of the fluid in the tubes at steady state is a little less near the center than toward the outside. For a non-Newtonian fluid at the same speed, the force normal to the stationary plate may be considerably greater toward the center. Although the steady state stress distribution between the plates is attained almost immediately, again it took several hours for the levels in the tubes to reach their final positions. Indeed, quite high stresses can occur near the center, and this principle has been used in the design of a pump for molten plastics. If the bottom disc is replaced by a very shallow cone, the stress normal to the stationary disc varies linearly with the logarithm of the distance from the axis of rotation. This logarithmic relation is expected for all memory fluids. These normal stress effects come directly from the nonlinearity in the stress deformation relation. This diagram represents steady, simple shearing between infinite parallel plates. In addition to the shear stresses, there are also normal stresses. For the Newtonian fluid, the normal stresses in these three directions are all the same. With nonlinearity in general, they will not be the same. We have just seen some experiments in cylindrical geometries. It is the inequality of the normal stresses on this infinitesimal volume element that gives rise to the normal stress phenomena which we have just observed. We have looked at some simple flow situations. Now let us look at two more complicated experiments. This tank contains two fluids, each of which is in its own compartment, but both of which can be subjected to the same air pressure. One of the fluids exhibits Newtonian behavior, the other non-Newtonian. 
the compartments have identical small orifices through which the liquids can be forced. Notice that with the non-Newtonian fluid, there is a considerable expansion of the stream as it emerges. When plastic articles are to be made by the extrusion process, the die must often be designed smaller than the dimensions desired in the finished product. Here, a sphere is rotating in a high polymer solution. Dye, introduced at the left, reveals the flow spiraling inward at the equator and outward at the pole. For a Newtonian fluid, on the other hand, where centrifugal forces are dominant, we would look for flow inward at the poles and outward at the equator. We have illustrated some phenomena that can occur with non-Newtonian fluids. The degree to which they occur depends on the particular material and the particular flow situation. In any case, when dealing with new fluids, especially those containing high polymers and suspensions, one should be on the lookout for time-dependent and nonlinear characteristics.